वसुदेव सुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So Jayant is our co-host this evening, and he's letting other people in as they come in. But we'll start. And as usual, you can give your comments and questions in the chat box, and also raise your hand if you want to interact directly. We are on the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and we had just seen that um, you know four kinds of devotees and. Um, those who are in distress those who want something those who are enquire spiritual inquirers and finally the enlightened one and the fully enlightened one is the one who sees brahman everywhere that brahman alone exists uh, and the realization of this fully enlightened one is vasudeva sarvamiti sa mahatma sudurlabha this mahatma this great great one uh, is very rare indeed who realizes that vasudeva or krishna brahman in that sense is everything and in advaitic sense brahman alone is it's not that brahman there, there is everything and somehow brahman has become everything no brahman has not become anything we realize that god alone exists or brahman alone exists and that is the soul reality vasudeva sarvamiti sa mahatma sudurlabha such a one is rare indeed now why don't people realize this or why don't people um become devoted to uh, to god the four kinds of devotees you know those who are in distress those who want something those who want are in spiritual seekers and those who are enlightened so why don't people become like that the 20th verse we are now going to start the 20th verse kamai stai stai srita jnana prapadyante nya devata tam tam niyamam asthaya prakritya niyata swaya deprived of discrimination by particular desires they worship other deities observing particular rites being swayed by their own nature so why don't people become devotees of god if that's that is such a great payoff all your worldly desires will will be fulfilled you will be protected in this world and you will become enlightened so why doesn't why don't people everybody should become devoted to god one kind of devotee or the other but most are not why not because their knowledge their understanding is um, is swept away they are under delusion for what kame hi tai tai kame hi by those individual just 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 say by desire those desires tai tai means by those by these these desires showing there is a multiplicity what desire sweeps away our understanding well if there was one like we could tell you there are, there are thousands as many things are there in the world and there are desires for uh, sense enjoyments there are desires uh, um, there are particular desires associated with uh, greed there are particular desires associated with um uh, obsessions and delusions people get obsessed by things by um ha- you know hobbies and by by other people people get obsessed um by even negative things like anger or depression they hold on to anger they are obsessed by that uh, by sense of resentment and anger or sometimes by sense of pervading depression unhappiness with the world all of these things many many this desire takes many forms you might say what is desire got to do with depression depression is just a reaction to desire depression simply direct reaction to desire desire is there not getting fulfilled not sufficiently fulfilled depression so anger depression greed um, then obsession kama krodha lobha all of them behind all of it is actually kama desire and a variety of desires what do they do they sweep away our understanding and then what happens then is very interesting prapadyante anya devata it's not that they give up religion or spirituality 
but their religion becomes a lower form of religion. They become uh, interested in particular religious rituals or practices which will fulfill their particular desires, their particular obsessions. Anya Devata means the other Devatas, the other gods. Here one must understand in Hinduism, there's God with a capital G and there are gods with small g. Small g gods are the Devas. The Devas are nothing other than sentient beings like us. They're just like us, Jivas. But they're very exalted in the sense with tremendous good karma, they have attained to powerful positions. So the position of the god of thunder or light and god of sun and the god, all small g. So different, different natural powers, uh, they have these devatas, god with small g's behind them. And they have, they are like, you know, in America now, you, instead of the small g gods, you have um, what, uh, super, Superman, Batman, and all these uh, Marvel comics uh, heroes. Yes, somebody told me that we are a young country here in the United States. So we don't have your ancient mythology of gods and demons. And so, but it's a natural, uh, natural kind of want, uh, kind of, in, kind of um, tendency in human mind to think of beings which are far more powerful than me. So I have certain capacity, but suppose someone is a um, hundred times stronger than me. I'd like, to, I know I am not, but I'd like to imagine such a, such a person or such a being. Or I can't walk through the door. I can't walk through the door, but I can't walk through a wall. I can imagine somebody who can walk through a wall uh, or somebody who can become invisible. So these are fascinating things for the human mind. And we like to think about it, that such powers are possible. Now, actually, they are possible. There are such beings according to our, at least uh, in ancient uh, stories, in our mythologies, in our understanding in, in Patanjali Yoga Sutras speak about some of these powers. So it's not impossible. And it has been known um, in uh, spiritual communities, especially tantrics and all, they, they possess. I firmly believe that uh, certain things are there. They are not supernatural. They're not at all supernatural. It's just, they're also natural. These powers are natural. I have seen some of these demonstrated. You can't explain it in any way, any, any way in, um, you know, in modern scientific ways. They are, they are also natural. These powers are natural. It's just that we, our understanding of nature is not comprehensive enough. If our understanding of nature becomes more comprehensive, then we will understand these powers are also part of nature. So there are beings with these extraordinary powers. And some of these beings, they, they exist in higher worlds called Swarga. Various kinds of heavenly realms are there. Lokas, various Lokas, heavenly realms. And they, are, they, they have various kinds of powers. Now, they have the power to grant certain boons. And there are uh, people who want their desires to be fulfilled, quickly become rich, or uh, quickly do some harm, even worse, you know, black magic, do some harm to um, some, some uh, particularly annoying neighbor. I remember a funny story. Once I was in our monastery in, in, in India, in uh, main monastery. So at the gate of the monastery, this lady came up and uh, she asked me, Baba, that means uh, monk, Baba, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, so very eagerly. And this is obviously something important to her. So she asked, do these mantras work? I said, of course, a mantra will, will definitely, it will work. And it has its own effect. She burst into tears. Oh my God, what will I do now? I said, what's wrong? Well, she said, my neighbor is particularly evil, you know, but uh, she has cast a black magic spell upon, uh, upon our family and uh, recited certain mantras. And you are saying that it will work and, and then we'll be ruined. What do I do now? I immediately said, oh, no, no, they don't work. These are all mere superstitions. Forget it. <laughs> then she looked at up, me up and down and Clearly, I was completely untrustworthy by that time in her. Just a minute ago, he was saying it works. Now, now he says it doesn't work. No, but there are people who believe these things very strongly. In fact, it happened to uh, Swami Vivekananda himself. And there was a, a particular tantric he came across in Kashmir. 
and uh, the tantric told him to get lost you know not not stay in that particular area otherwise he would cast a spell upon vivekananda and viveka and it happened vivekananda became violently ill then he came back and complained to masharada that i uh, i have completely lost faith i mean sort of in a little resentful tone i've lost faith in in thakur sri ram krishna he couldn't protect me from a little tantric and then masharada smiled and said vidya mante hai baba one must respect knowledge no matter whatever kind of knowledge it is uh, so she is sharada herself so all knowledge is part of her and one must respect knowledge and these powers anyway the point is people become attracted to these things every village in india had their local deities and local rituals often sacrifices including animal sacrifices in order to propitiate for what for bhakti or advaitic knowledge or samadhi no not at all for the welfare of humanity not at all for casting a spell on your neighbor or for uh, getting um, you know good profits in business something like that or maybe rainfall some whatever it is some kind of natural benefit notice all of these the so called supernatural this um, practices uh, in order to pacify certain deities certain powers and get them on your side behind it is one thing only and that is desire desires of various types but desire basically uh, so desire prompted these people rush to anya devata now today we might think here in america in 21st century we might smile at those superstitious you know indian villagers with their little deities and superstitious rituals and um they the, you know petty practices uh, they have not all disappeared many of the villages they still have those practices they still go on they're pretty uh, popular we have in our this country uh, our equivalent and worse it goes under the umbrella overarching umbrella called new age we have got so many things here this one is in into astral projection that one is into um, you know out of body travels uh, another one is into the effect of uh, crystals uh, another one is in into gem therapy someone is into past life regression a third another one is into hypnosis now uh, don't misunderstand me i am not saying that they are all fraudulent or they don't work some of them actually do work some of them actually have effects i know for myself they do have effects but they are all low i am let's be very clear about it they are not spiritual they are and let alone compared to advaita vedanta advaita vedanta is the highest it's the path of knowledge the final conclusions of the upanishads human civilization in last 5000 years till today has not thought higher thoughts more sublime thoughts than what are found in the upanishads there nothing there nothing compares in the world tell me what compares to the upanishads Uh, in in the world it's not just advaita vedanta these things are not even close to devotion to god bhakti they're not even close to meditation samadhi patanjali yoga they're not even close to nowhere near close to the worship of divinity in all beings through service through good works karma yoga karma yoga bhakti yoga raja yoga gyana yoga these are sublime these are spiritual all these other things they are lower there no doubt about it if you have come to spiritual life then don't take uh, to these things this is what krishna is warning against it's not some peculiar deity in some out of the way remote um, indian village uh, they are uneducated uh, and uh, they don't know any better they, they are sacrificing a chicken on the altar of some <laughs> some deity we may think oh we are far superior no Um, they are not far superior we do exactly the same things and we probably in many ways f- far more foolish uh, whether it's a, a small village uh, in some uh, corner in in a, in a jungle in india or it's in california and it's the same thing especially in california so um, i remember let me tell you a story about a monk i met a very impressive monk non dualist i met him in the uh, himalayas uh, um i all right i can take his name also 
Narayananda Giri. I haven't met him for 15 years now. I hope he's well. A very impressive, very learned monk, and traditionally learned and full of vairagya, living alone in high up in the mountains. He told me his story. He said, as a child in a village, he was very fascinated, not with you know devotion or jnana and you know knowledge of Atman. No, he was fascinated with tantra. And why with tantra? Not for enlightenment. Because Tantra promised all these, you know, superpowers. So it's just like today a kid might want to be like Superman or Batman or Spider-Man, just like that. So he was very interested that could I get those powers, you know, to fly through the air and to fulfill wishes and to uh, cast a spell on somebody, uh, read minds of other people. So he uh, went to, he had heard of a great Tantric who lived in uh, Benares, the holy city. He told me all this, his, his, his personal life story. And he said, um, I went there as a young boy in search of this tantric. And those who have been to Benares, you know, those narrow lanes. Um, he went, he found the tantric's home in one of those narrow lanes. So he told me that he went to meet this tantric and there was a queue, a line. So many people early in the morning had gathered to meet. Every day there was a long line out of, outside that tantric's door. Um, so he stood in the line and as the people went into the doorway, they stepped into the doorway and walked in the, into a sunny courtyard. It was a winter. And he saw there was an armchair and like a shapeless bundle of clothes. Actually, it was this frail old man covered up. Uh, Benares winters can be cold. So covered up uh, nicely with shawls and socks and cap. And apparently to all purposes, asleep you know, curled up on this um, armchair in the winter sun in the courtyard. And all these people, they would step up to him, bow down to him and give some offering, mostly money in front of him and make a wish and then go on. And their belief was if they offered something to him in return, their wishes will be fulfilled, that he was supposed to be such a powerful tantric. Anyway, so, they, so this line proceeded until this boy, the monk told me that when his turn came, he came, stepped in front of that old man who seemed frail and sick and ill and all covered up, bundled up and oblivious of anybody else. His eyes were closed. He says, as I stepped up to him, suddenly his eyes flew open and he stared directly at me. And he says, you can learn this and become a tantric, but you will become like this, like me. Look at me. Is this what you want? So uh, this monk said, I stood there stunned. And I was a shy young boy, so I didn't know what to say. I looked at him stunned. And then the tantric with his glowing eyes, <laughs> sort of uh, looking straight into me, he said, you go and learn Vedanta. And then closed his eyes and apparently fell asleep again. <laughs> So that was so uh, electrifying, you know, shocking. Anyway, then this uh, monk said, then I asked him, what did you do? He said, I went and it so happened that I did actually go to an ashram and they enrolled me in, in a Vedanta course uh, in the university and I studied Vedanta and so on. And I asked him, did you ever learn Tantra? He said, I did. I studied it myself text-wise, but it's not that I actually learned it from a guru or something. Then I asked him once, this monk, who was actually a very great Vedantic. By the way, one thing which has become pretty famous, the story of Yesach Yavosach. Is this true or is that true? You know, the story of King Janaka, uh, the dream and the waking. That story I had heard from this monk uh, first time. He told me this story. And now it's pretty popular, I think. Was that true or is this true? <laughs> anyway, I asked this monk once, so would you consider Tantra like technology and Vedanta like science? So Vedanta is like Advaita Vedanta is the theory and Tantra may be like engineering, you know, like you know, the techniques. And then he, I still remember he said, Are nahi Mahatma ji, Vedanta bahut unchi cheez hai. Ye kaha hai? He said, oh, no uh, Mahatma, no, no dear monk. Vedanta is such a high, a sublime philosophy. There's no comparison at all. Uh, so what I was talking, of course, he was talking about the lower kind of Tantra, which leads to all these, uh, you know, um, occult powers. 
So that's the point. And there are those who worship various deities, whether they are in little villages tucked away in the forests of, in, in India or in California, but they worship various deities. And all of them, why do they do that? They're prompted by desire, desire prompted. It happens in Advaita Vedanta also. I have seen because of today we popularize something that I am also doing here. We throw it open to everybody. And this is the age when all knowledge is thrown open and it should happen. Swami Vivekananda himself said that Vedanta which was in the hands of a few, a few uh, scholars and monks, uh, I shall spread, broadcast it across the world. The Vedanta which was in the forests and mountains, I shall scatter it across the cities. So that's what Vivekananda said and it's true. This is the age. But, but, and, and I fully support this, but there is something to be said about the restrictions that the ancients put upon it. The, the, the um, emphasis on adhikari, a qualified student, one who has the discernment between eternal and non-eternal, viveka, one who has strong dispassion for worldliness, uh, vairagya, the six-fold treasures, an intense desire for freedom. So all of these things, this is called adhikari, fourfold qualifications. There is a reason for this. The reason is only when one has sufficiently developed adhikara, qualifications, then um, Vedanta, you know, they take to Vedanta. Um, in Hindi, they say Vedanta pachti hai. Vedanta gets uh, assimilated, digested. Otherwise, what I've seen often, people come, they're curious, they're interested. And uh, they are talking about, um, they hear lessons about pure consciousness and the seer and the seen and the analysis of the five levels of the human personality uh, and the three states of uh, the mind, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras and the Gita. And then uh, somebody tells them, you know, if you do this kind of a meditation here, you will see a burst of light. And they say, wow, that's what I wanted all along. Now, what has happened? Or you do that kind of uh, a past life regression therapy, you will discover who you were in the past life. And say, wow, that's what I was interested in all along. All of the Vedanta you have heard till now, it seems, seems some kind of philosophy, some kind of abstraction, instead of the most stunning direct statement of the truth. It doesn't work. It's not get, it doesn't get uh, assimilated digested. Why not? Desire. There is still desire in the mind and the other, whether it's in some new age uh, technology or some uh, ancient deity in a remote village, generally the ancient deities in remote villages are actually more powerful than the, than the new age stuff. But that promises to fulfill my desire. And this is a problem that Vedanta has always faced all throughout. You know, one monk, he writes about his childhood, he used to go to a monk who would teach Vedanta outside their village on the bank of the Ganga. So he would gather around with, with a few uh, elders from the village and he was the only little boy who would go to listen to Vedanta. And uh, one day he went and he saw nobody else was there. And the monk was sitting there and the little boy asked the monk, where are, where's everybody else? The monk said, oh, there's a tantric who has come on the other side of the river. And the whole, all villages, everybody has rushed there. And then the monk said dolefully, this is always the state of Vedanta through the ages. Uh, very few people are interested. There is a story about this. One uh, monk said this. I'll tell you the story and don't misunderstand. I'm not criticizing anything. I'm not condemning anything. I will qualify the story. The story is a bit harsh. Those who know the story of Ramayana, they will relate to this. So this monk told a story that um, Hanuman, when he went and attacked Lanka, the abode of the demon king Ravana, uh, in search for, uh, you know, he, he, had, he was uh, in search of Sita. So Ravana's son, Indrajit, uh, the, the demon king's son, uh, Indrajit, he went up to fight with Hanuman. And he was having a very difficult time of it. And Indrajit thought he had to deploy his most powerful weapon, you know, like you have cruise missiles and stealth bombers. And so the most powerful weapon 
uh, always is the, called the Brahmastra, the, the divine weapon of Brahma, not Brahma, not the ultimate reality, but the deity Brahma. So Brahmastra. Brahmastra is supposed to be the ultimate weapon. So he deploys that to, to capture uh, Hanuman, to knock Hanuman out of the fight. Now Brahmastra approaches Hanuman. Of course, Brahmastra is an intelligent smart weapon. It's got its own artificial intelligence or whatnot. It comes and approaches Hanuman and says, would you please surrender to me? It's a, it's a matter of prestige. I'm the most powerful weapon of the gods. And if, if, you, if, you are, if I don't work, then, you know, then all the, the stock prices of the armament manufacturer will go down. <laughs> uh, all Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed, their, they will, their stock prices on Wall Street will crash. I have to work. It's a question of prestige. And Hanuman says, I have the greatest respect for Brahma. So, um, yes, I'm going to lose consciousness now. And he fell down unconscious. And so Brahmastra had worked. Now the demons, the Rakshashas, they rejoiced. And uh, they thought they're great. Uh, this big monkey has been now captured. But being demons, they, they, they were people of very little faith. So they thought, this Brahmastra, well, it seems a bit iffy. I mean, I'm sure Hanuman, this great monkey has been knocked out. Let's make sure. Let's tie him up with ropes. So they tied him up with ropes. Now, Brahmastra felt terribly insulted. You know, if you, if you hit somebody with a cruise missile and then, chase, and then hit him further with a hammer, the cruise missile is going to feel insulted. So Brahmastra felt, oh, they don't have faith in me. They want, I knocked out Hanuman and they want to tie him up with these miserable ropes. Well, let them deal with it. I'm, I'm leaving. In a huff, he left and the, the weapon, Brahmastra went back to heaven. And uh, immediately, Hanuman regained consciousness. And the ropes were, of course, uh, no problem for him. And we know how he slipped out. It's a story every little uh, child in India knows. And then the, he devastated the land of the demons. Anyway, this is the story. Now, what's the moral of the story? When you have taken refuge in something higher, in the highest, don't try to back it up with something lower. You are studying real nature, your own real nature, which is unlimited pure consciousness. But yes, but I'd like to consult an astrologer too and get a few gemstones you know, to wear around my neck and my finger, just in case Vedanta doesn't work, and to protect myself from the baneful influence of this planet and that planet. No, don't do that. You're insulting Vedanta. You're insulting the Upanishads. All right. The qualification to this, I am not condemning any of those practices. I actually know for a fact that many of them have a core of truth and they do work. But the point here is, and anybody who is a good astrologer will also tell you, they know it for a fact. They'll tell you that, yes, of course, Vedanta and Sankhya and Bhakti, these are high, very high and sublime things. Don't compare us with them. That shows that that person will be a genuine practitioner of his art. Um, don't apply this to Bhakti or Dhyana. Bhakti is also sublime. Just as jnana, the path of knowledge is sublime, the path of devotion and surrender is sublime, the path of meditation is sublime, and the path of unselfish, selfless work is also sublime. They are not to be counted among lower things. Some are Advaita, non-dual fanatics. So once you have taken to non-dualism, I, I heard a great Advaita teacher grumbling that uh, they come here and learn Advaita, non-dualism. And the, the first sign of trouble, they run to God. <laughs> they take refuge in God. They don't want to stick with I am Brahman. What can an appearance, you know, sickness and uh, financial failure or whatever it is. They are appearances like dreams. What is it to me? I am the unlimited awareness. It's very easy to say. When kicks and blows come in life, not so easy to uh, withstand them. Um, that's why... It is perfectly all right to take refuge in God. Swami Vivekananda says that always, he told an American lady here, uh, always keep these two sides, madam. Uh, one, when I am I'm perfectly all right and happy, I say I am Brahman. I am the Atman. 
And when I have a tummy ache, I say mother. And there's nothing wrong in keeping these two sides. So, yes. And when you talk about the highest knowledge, it means Advaita Vedanta, but also included within it are sublime teachings of bhakti and yoga and karma yoga, all of that. All right. Again, no condemnation of uh, anything or any particular art uh, I'm not, or any particular science. Uh, one must have common sense. There are people who can hold on to I am Brahman only and not take refuge in anything else. Swami Turiyananda, once he was very sick, he was in the mountain, uh, foothills of the Himalayan mountains. He was practicing severe austerities and became very sick, in stomach trouble. And then he suffered so much, he thought that let me go to the nearby um, town and consult a doctor. The moment he thought this, and he thought, fie on me, what am I say, uh, doing? Uh, there's a verse which says, Narayana is the greatest doctor, and the water of Ganga is the greatest medicine. So he immediately drank the water of Ganga, and he would rub it on his stomach, uh, reciting a verse from the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that four kinds of food Vaishvanaro Bhutva Pachamyannam Chatur Vidham I am the digestive fire the Lord says I am the digestive fire in the stomach which digests all kinds of four kinds of food 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita luckily he was cured but it takes a tremendous willpower to uh, hold on to that if we cannot at this stage in our life and we want to take refuge in God and take refuge in the doctor and do that definitely What Sri Krishna here is criticizing is not taking refuge in spirituality, not taking refuge in God. He's saying, especially it is about devotion, not becoming a bhakta of God, the devotee of God, rather holding on to a whole range of various kinds of rituals, little um, you know, um, practices of worshipping this deity and that deity, or a whole uh, range of... Uh, interests in new age spirituality and so on. So that's what Krishna is saying. That Become a devotee of God. Hold on to God. Te te niyama masthaya. They, they follow the particular rituals of those deities. And why do they do that? Prakritya niyata asvaya. They are guided by their own prakriti. By their own um, Natures. What is this own nature? Our real nature is Satchidanand, existence, consciousness, bliss. But our individual nature is this sentient beings. We are all different from each other. Where does this difference come from? This difference comes from a subtle body. And this is, has been conditioned through many lifetimes of experience. We have done many things. We have heard many things, experienced many things, lifetime after lifetime. And these have left samskaras in us. And the sum total of these samskaras is our nature today, our prakriti today. Prachina samskara, prachina karma vasana. So these desires and the effects of karma in ancient lifetimes. So those are, you know, curled up in this bottomless well of our mind, and they bubble up sometimes. That's our nature. Our nature is guided by those things. As a victim to that, we are swept along. We have these little fancies. Our interests. In, uh, in, in all these lower forms of uh, belief, uh, practices. Vedanta is very high. Advaita Vedanta is, I, I call it a finishing school for spirituality. I've seen many people who drift, come to Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, then drift away from it, but they come back to it. At least some of them do, ultimately, after seeing this and that, this teacher, that book, this seminar, that, so many things, and then finally, drift back into it. They begin to see there is really not anything so sublime and high and noble as Advaita Vedanta. But why do they drift away at all at the beginning? It's desire. Then 21 Yo yo yang yam tanum bhakta shraddha yachitum ichati tasya tasya chalam shraddham tam 
whatsoever form a particular devotee wishes to worship with faith, concerning that alone I make his faith unflinching. So even the faith in those practices, that particular deity, I will sacrifice a chicken to it and get a bump in my salary. Or uh, that particular, you know, crystal therapy, hypnotherapy, something, by that I will uh, solve my, all my problems. That faith, that comes from God and that faith actually works. It gives a certain amount of result. Achalam Shraddham. Faith, Shraddha, that um, firm, strong belief, there's a tremendous power in that. When it is directed to God, it leads to enlightenment. It leads to God realization, enlightenment, the goal of human life. When it's directed to anything else, or the lower deities or some particular practice, uh, as long as there's some core truth to it, if you direct your faith to it, or something worldly, my faith is in money, my faith is in, in a college degree, my faith is in politics, it will take you far. If strong faith in it, that faith itself will take you far. That conviction, that strength of purpose and oneness, it will take you far. The one-pointedness, it will take you far. That book, which became very popular a few years ago, The Secret, um, Rhonda Byrne, uh, it became so popular. That is based on just one thing, one simple thing. But whatever you want in life, if you single-mindedly hold on to it, don't take no for an answer. From whom? From the universe, from people, from experiences in your life, from what other thing, what's happening in your life. Don't take a no anywhere. Just hold on to that. Think about it all the time and keep on repeating. Think that, speak about that, do that, hold on to that. In spite of what happens in the world, you will get success. Whether you want money, your relationship, you want power, um, power, politics, success in career, whatever, health. So that's the promise of that book. It's called The Secret. And it became very, very, you can, as, as you can guess, <laughs> bestseller list for years and years and years. Um, so the, and she wrote a new book. Uh, our Rick Archer has interviewed her. And the new book is The Greatest Secret uh, or The Final Secret. The, and that book says that the, the greatest secret, the final secret is uh, Advaita Vedanta, higher than that earlier secret. So the earlier secret, greatest secret, yes, Rick says, greatest secret. So the earlier book is you can fulfill your worldly desires by sheer faith, one, one pointed belief, and you must follow it up with thought, and, thought, word, and deed. And you will get it. Hold on to it long enough, the universe will give you what you want. Actually, Swami Vivekananda says that. But he says just one twist. Uh, the secret says that you pursue what you want and hold on to it one-pointedly, you will get it. Swami Vivekananda says never desire anything because you will get it. You will get it. Shankaracharya in the commentary in another in the next verse, he says basically the same thing. He says that do not desire anything. There is Nothing good about desires. The non-fulfillment of desires leads to frustration, unhappiness. The fulfillment of desires leads to addiction and uh, further desires. With as desires keep on increasing, no good comes of cultivating desires. Anyway, but the point is, what Rhonda Byrne is saying and uh, uh, Vivekananda is saying, they're saying both. Same thing, that you will get it if you want to. And uh, the secret of that, Krishna says here, is that one-pointed faith, achalam shuddha. And Krishna says, I give them that faith, unflinching faith, in that little practice. Then, the next one, 22. Sataya Shaddhaya Yukta Tasya Radhanami Hate Labhate Chatata Kaman Mayeva Bihitan Hitan. Endowed with that faith, he worships that deity and from him gets his desires, which are indeed granted by me alone. So, endowed with that faith, Taya Shaddhaya Yukta. 
This literally, this is the core idea of uh, uh, the secret, that book, Rhonda Byrne's secret. Yukta means hold on to that. How long? As long as it takes till you get the result. When? Every moment, moment to moment. At every point, you have the power to take a decision. So I can't hold on to something even for a few hours. What, what to speak of days and months. You don't have to hold on to anything for a few hours. Can you hold on to something, a thought, for one moment? Yes. All of us will say, we can, hold, we can have a thought for one moment. It's just that I can't sustain a thought. It doesn't matter. The next moment is another moment of freedom, of choice. That next moment, I have a choice about what to think, what to say, and what to do. Take a, take a decision. Decide. I will now think of this particular desire, and I will... Uh, uh, speak accordingly and it will do accordingly. Next moment, we will take care of itself. Again, the choice will come. Again, the freedom will come. That freedom comes to us moment to moment, minute to minute, hour to hour, day after day, week after week, month after month. It's a great power, the power of choice. Mind tricks us. You don't have the strength of mind. You make a choice and then within hours, within a day, you don't follow anything. That's because we are not repeating the choice. You have to keep repeating. You have the freedom to repeat the choice anytime. So that thing, sir, Shraddhaya Yukta, Taya Aradhanam Ihate, he engages in that practice. He makes it, that faith, that choice, he makes it a practice. Whatever deity you're worshipping, whatever new age philosophy or practice you're following, and you get the result. The results also come. Krishna says, I give those results. Vihitan, hitan. I give those results. Here in the commentary, Shankaracharya makes a point. He says, none of this leads to any good. Ultimately. Of course, he's speaking from an Advaitic perspective. Ultimately, none of this leads to any good. Fulfillment of all these desires just traps you further and further in worldliness. Quickly, a wise person should quickly come out of it. Satisfy some of the desires and see that all the other desires. I've got a million dollars. Or um, say a hundred thousand dollars is the same thing as getting a billion dollars and ten billion dollars and a hundred billion dollars. In principle, it's the same thing. If you win the rat race, you're still a rat. So, in principle, it is the same thing a wise person will see. Why follow it any further? Time is going away. Age and energy and you know all of this health are slipping away from, from us just like so fast. And this time, once it goes up, it will never come back. And this uh, health, this youth, this energy, this freshness will never come back. So do not waste time in uh, frivolities. If your aim is God-realization, Brahma, Jnana, enlightenment, then as quickly as possible, jump into it and hold on. The way you held on to the pursuit of desires, with that kind of vigor and energy, hold on to the pursuit of enlightenment. It's the highest pursuit. The greatest adventure that human beings can uh, embark upon. Uh, the adventure to know God. The adventure to realize our own infinite nature. The adventure to fulfill the goal of human life. The purpose of human life. This is what we are here for. So, Shankara says in his commentary on this verse actually, that um, it is no good. Pursuing desires is no good. See, the moment you pursue desires, one sadhu put it this way, apne aap ko kangal banana hi to hai. You have made yourself a, a beggar. You who are infinite, immortal existence, you make yourself small. Not infinite existence, a tiny existence. That's why I want something from outside. I feel the lack in my existence. I feel the lack in my awareness, I feel the lack in my satisfaction. My sat, chit, ananda, I do not believe them to be infinite. Therefore, I go out begging. But nothing in the world can give you this. It's your own reality. Whatever the world is giving it is uh, reflecting your own reality back to you in a fragmented way. Nothing can satisfy, fulfill us which the world gives. It cannot fulfill us. So it's a fool's quest to try to find fulfillment in the world. The world Engagement with the world can help us to go, grow spiritually, certainly. That's why the world is there. But to expect it to fulfill us, that is a fool's quest. It, uh, it's a mature person who learns it quickly enough. In, immature persons keep on trying. 
to get happiness in this way and that way. The most foolish persons, they keep on trying the same thing, hoping it will give them happiness. The, that's the definition of insanity. To keep on doing the same thing in the, hoping, in the hope of getting different results, the definition of insanity. The more intelligent persons, they try different ways of getting fulfillment. Money, and learning, and uh, relationships, and politics, and uh, uh, social work, and uh, better and better and better, art, science, better and better things. There are a variety of things to get fulfillment. Still, it doesn't work. Ultimately, you're thrown back upon yourself. Who is the one who's seeking fulfillment? What is this thing which is seeking fulfillment in an object? When we look towards ourselves and we find we are ever fulfilled, That Sadhu put it very beautifully. He says, to apne aapko kangal banana hi to, hai. to ask something of some, something of some, somebody or the world, you know, is to make yourself a beggar. So that secret, I want this from the universe. And continuously I want, want, want. But what am I making myself in that case? I'm affirming that I lack. But do I really lack? I've never investigated. Do I really lack anything? I've never investigated it. Then 23. Antavattu phalam tesham tadbhavatyalpa medhasam devan deva yajo yanti madbhakta yanti mamapi So these people, the translation is, but that fruit of these men of little understanding has an end. The worshippers of God, small g, go to the gods, but my devotees come to me. What he says here is, what's wrong with this uh, approach? Uh, you know, various little practices to fulfill various desires in this world. What's wrong with it? He says, all of these, these things you will get. He's saying that, not saying that you will not get it. These practices of worship of the various deities, they have their result. Antavattu phalam. The result is very limited. You think by doing this particular ritual, I will become healthy. Oh, you might for a time. From that particular disease, another disease will come. And in any case, after some time, the same disease can come back again. By this, let uh, me get wealth. So they say that if you wear a particular gem around your arm or do this particular ritual, you will get wealth. You might. What you deserved a little more than that, one, one it might come. Shankaracharya comments that um, according to our karma phala, we get by the worship of these deities. One might ask that if we get things according to our karma, why would you need to worship these deities? The thing is, our karma is vast. It's like a huge storehouse and we have no idea what's there. But if you engage in particular practices, certain things become uh, expedited. You know, out of the storehouse, something might be uh, released faster. But that will still depend upon uh, the limits of our karma. So two persons, so maybe uh, a great king performs a, a, a particular ritual to get victory and wealth might conquer an empire. And a little village trader performs a similar ritual. So the village trader, according to his karma, will get a little more money, maybe get a couple of more shops in the village. And the king will get um, add a few more countries to his empire. The karma scale is different. But yes, success is there. According to our karma, we will get more success than we would have otherwise got. Um, but antavat. All of these things come to an end and very soon. This is what the little boy Nachiketa realized when the Lord of Death, Yama, in the Kathopanishad we are studying, Yama tempted him. He said, you don't have to perform any of these rituals. Whatever people are, they desire in this world and the next, you get all of it. Don't ask me the question about Vedanta. You get all of these things in your life. All wealth and pleasure and power and fame. And Nachiketa's argument was, he said, I don't want anything. Why not? They all come to an end. Sarvendriyani, Jarayanti, Teja. All our 
Api sarvam alpameva. Everything is too little. I'm offering you so much wealth and pleasure without end. And he says, live a hundred years, have grandsons and great grandsons and enjoy a wonderful, you know, professional life, family life, community life. And the little boy says, it's too little. It's just too little. Why is it too little? When it ends, it's all gone. It's gone forever. Nothing is left behind. He says, you are de- there, O Lord of death. You are there. As long as you are around, everything is too little. The moment I'll come to you, as end comes, everything is taken away from me. Well, at least you have enjoyed a lot in this life. You can enjoy as much as you want. No, our capacities for enjoyment are also very limited. How much can you eat? How much, um, you know, how many movies can you watch? How many vacations can you take? How many phones can you talk in? So, Sarvendriyani Jarayanti Teja, our body mind is worn down, is worn down, wear and tear. I will live life to the hilt. Well, you'll get worn down yourself. Your capacities are very limited. Then nothing will seem enjoyable anymore. Somerset mom, I like quoting, he says that if you single-mindedly chase pleasure, very soon you find nothing uh, pleasing anymore. Single-mindedly chase pleasure, very soon you find nothing pleasing anymore. Very good observation. Here Krishna says, Antavattu phalam tesham. You may do all these practices, but everything will be finished and gone. And when they are gone, they are totally gone. And in the meantime, your life has been frittered away. This most precious human life. Therefore, he says, Alpa medha sam. They are foolish. They have very little medha. What is very little medha? Buddhi and medha are different. Buddhi means intellect. Some of these people may be pretty smart. Very smart people. They can earn millions on, and billions on Wall Street. Uh, or, you know, be philosophers or whatnot. Very intelligent uh, people. And they have all the arguments at their disposal. But why Alpa medha sam? The distinction is between intellect and some a peculiar quality called medha. That dharanavati buddhi, the buddhi which is able to retain spiritual teachings, the intellect which is able to retain. You talk about I'm not the body mind. That every oh, simple things like all things come to an end. All these are ultimately not fulfilling. Something that Najiketa saw very clearly. So many um, grown up rich, talented, intelligent, mature people, they don't see. They are completely mature compared to that little boy Nachiketa. They don't see it. It's unable to retain the teachings. We study Vedanta also. Get all these things. You know, simple things like things are impermanent. You'll go, yes, I know. So, and still go on and, and chase those impermanent things. But what a devastating thing that, that statement. It's a Buddha statement. Uh, Impermanent, impermanent, all is impermanent. Transient, uh, momentary, momentary, all is momentary. Empty, empty, all is empty. Therefore, suffering, suffering, all is suffering. Anityam, anityam, sarvam, anityam. Uh, kshanikam, kshanikam, sarvam, kshanikam. Shunyam, shunyam, sarvam, shunyam. Therefore, dukkham, dukkham, sarvam, dukkham. All is suffering. People don't see it. This ability to retain the spiritual teaching, let it sink in. It's sinking in, retaining it. This is called dharana. The ability to hold on. Granthartha, uh, granthartha dharana shakti. The ability to hold on to the, the significance of a teaching, of a text. Not just the verses, not just the words. That is memorization. But the essence is assimilated. I point out often where Vedanta is being dis- uh, discussed in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. In one point, Sri Ramakrishna is sitting and listening carefully. At the end of the discussion about Vedanta, Brahman, Atman, Maya, all of that, and Sri Ramakrishna just comments, the words are good, but it must be assimilated. In Bengali, he said, Kosa gulo to bhalo, dharana hawa chai. The words are good, but dharana is there. So that power of assimilating a subtle truth an insight. And the, how do you know it's been assimilated? You see it in the life of that person. Life will change. You can't live the old way anymore. The psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, he said, insight separated from practice remains, insight divorced from practice remains ineffective. 
insight. You understand something about life. But divorced from practice, you don't do anything about it. Then it remains ineffective. It will have no, no effect on your life. You understood something about life, doesn't help you. Insight divorced from practice remains ineffective. Then he says, so he says, Alpa Medha Sam, these are foolish. They, have, they don't have Medha. They may be intelligent, but they don't have the power of holding on to that insight. I think we have almost run out of time. All right, the next few verses we'll do next time. Let's quickly look at the comments. Nidjari says the bar is very high to be an adhikari. Uh, true, but that is, it's not all or nothing. We all have it to some extent. So the very fact that you are here, it means that we are an adhikari. Just that we have to be, um, it's, uh, we have to watch those, those, like those dials in a car when you're driving. You keep an eye on the, you know, the, the gas in your tank, the uh, speed dial, how fast you're going, um, the temp engine temperature. And take a look at the mirrors, which you'll be aware of the environment. We must be aware of our internal spiritual environment. Is my discernment, Viveka, strong? Is my dispassion for the world strong? Are my disciplines, sixfold treasures, strong? And do I have a desire for enlightenment, freedom from this world? That's enough. Is there an acknowledgement? Parul says, is acknowledgement? Parul Singh says, good morning from India. Aren't you in Singapore? Is there an acknowledgement of the concept of Buri Nazar, evil eye in Vedanta? <laughs> yes, it's a very um, common thing in India or in many, many cultures actually. Somebody's cast an evil eye on you. <laughs> yeah, Vedanta don't talk, talk about those things. Then Peter says, oh, okay, something else. Sangeeta says, it bears noting that birthday observance, tithi or determination of date and time uh, of the puja seems to be based on Vedic calendar. It adheres to the framework of Vedic astrology. Yes. So Vedic astrology, it's part of the six Vedangas. Very ancient. And Munda Kopanishad mentions it. In addition to the Vedas, there are six disciplines which are necessary to understand the Vedas. Tutra Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Samaveda, uh, Atharva Veda, Shiksha Kalpa, Vyaka Ranam Niruktam, Chando Jyotishamiti. Jyotisha is one of the what is called the six Vedangas, the six auxiliary disciplines uh, which help us to understand the Vedas. So there's no criticism of astrology there. Astrologers need not get upset and that Krishna is criticizing them or I am criticizing uh, astrology. No, what Krishna is criticizing is don't depend on astrology for. Um, you know, taking you beyond suffering. Catch hold of God. Let your goal be through God, through devotion to God, I shall overcome suffering in this world, attain moksha, God realization. That is the goal. And through God plus a little bit of astrology. <laughs> Bill says, the Greeks say, gods punish man by granting their prayers. Astrology is very, very powerful. Uh, I once was invited to um, a conference, international conference of astrologers. And so I went there and uh, I was surprised. And the whole audience was full of astrologers that gathered from all over the world. And uh, I was surprised to see uh, on the platform, the speakers, there were ministers and governors and all big people you know, from society. I asked the or one of the organizers, how do you get all of these people, uh, you know, on, on stage together? And uh, he, he whispered, oh, but they all come for, for predictions about their life, you know, to us. So <laughs> all of them, no matter how well knowledgeable, powerful, politically well-connected, they are all uh, uh, beholden to the astrologer. They may not be particularly interested in Vedanta. They won't come to the Swami or to the philosophy professor. And they find that pretty useless in life. But astrologer, no, very important. 
Bill says the Greeks say that gods punish man by granting their prayers. Correct. Fulfilling desires. Patrick says the greatest secret is not a huge bestseller like the first one. Yes, correct. Advaita is not as a huge, uh, you know, the Jnana Kanda is not a huge bestseller like the Karma Kanda. I've seen this again and again. Talk about the highest philosophy, Vedanta, Sankhya, and so on. And then finally mention a particular ritual or a particular breathing technique. And I've literally seen this reaction. Right, that's what I was looking for. After all, Vedanta and Sankhya. And what to speak of others? A great scholar, one of the greatest scholars I've met. Um, he became very interested in astrology in his, um, you know, late, in his late 80s, early 90s. So once I was speaking with this great, great pundit, he has passed now. So anyway, I won't take his name. And he was really a, a very good pundit. So I was on the same stage with him. He was hard of hearing. So I had to shout my questions. I said, sir, uh, why after studying Vedanta and Sankhya and all, you know, mastering all of that, why are you giving so much time to astrology? And, you know, he leaned like this. And he was a frank old man. He had nothing. He didn't mince words. He listened carefully and he said, oh, that. There's no money in Vedanta or Sankhya. He said, he did it. no money in Vedanta or Sankhya. So money, he's very clear about it. Astrology gets him lots of money. And he proudly told me how uh, India's greatest film star flew him by, by plane uh, to Mumbai to, give, to consult on his uh, son and son's marriage to his daughter-in-law. They are like India's most famous uh, star couple. I mean, I would not name them, but uh, film stars. So there was some problem in the astrological matching their, uh, their horoscopes and all. So this astrologer, this great scholar of the Advaita and the Sankhya and all, he was called not for Brahman and Atman and all that, but to talk about um, matching the horoscopes and what rituals had to be done so that the bride and bridegroom could be matched properly. Rama says, what is the difference between asking God for a worldly pursuit and asking other deities for the same? It seems the same. Isn't God who hel ultimately helps us, whether we worship him in the form of deity or God himself? No, the form of the deity is ultimately it will not take you to God realization. Remember, um, God, Sri Krishna himself has said that those who worship me for material things, those who worship me for rescue from distress, they have faith in me. In Faith in me means faith in God with capital G. And that will ultimately lead them to liberation. But if your faith is in crystals or hypnotherapy, that will give you some benefit maybe. Nothing much more than that. Patrick says, do these rituals generate good karma? Yes, they do. That's how they work. Last class, Rick had asked, how do these Vedic rituals work? So the, the idea is that the Vedic rituals, the chanting of the mantras and the performance of those rituals generates um, a huge amount of good karma. There's a technical word for that in Mimamsa called Apurva, a unique result, which is an invisible result. You say, how do we know? By faith. But why should we have faith? Because the Vedas say so. so. That way it works like that. Because of those huge amounts of good karma, you get the results. The rituals are supposed to do the same thing. Ramya says, so when Sri Krishna says he stabilizes their faith in lesser deeds, gods, he's basically bringing these people into the categories of art and Arthat. Is that correct? No. He stabilizes the faith in the lesser gods and they pursue those ends and they get what they want. But that's it. Then they will be disappointed in that and finally come and take refuge in God with capital G. What Krishna is saying is that this is not wise. It is much better to realize that pursuit of the lower goals, uh, artha and karma, will not give you happiness. And have devotion to God and, and uh, be devoted to God. Finally, God realization, moksha is the goal. Bill says, one has to experience the emptiness of all these coveted things in order to turn once back on them. Logic won't convince. True. That's what Sri Ramakrishna used to say. That unless the time is ripe, it will not work. You can give lots of lectures. That's why Krishna's approach is actually better. Those who want things in the world very much, don't stop them. What will happen is, 
If you give them long lectures on Vedanta and God realization is the actual goal and what you are pursuing, that will not make you happy. Ultimately, it will make you unhappy. Don't do that. Don't run after money. Don't run after uh, relationships. Don't run after political power. Then what will happen is, because what you are saying is true, that person it will feel true to that person. But it will just damage their shraddha, their faith. So don't damage the faith of anybody. If a person deeply, truly believes that becoming rich, becoming powerful is the way to do it. Then the, at the best, if you can help, make them do it in a, uh, in a moral way, in a sustainable way, dharma, dharmic way. Pursue worldly goals in a dharmic way. At least that will stop them from doing damage to themselves and to society. Then they will slowly evolve. It's a slow process, lifetimes maybe. And Krishna is patient. Uh, patient. We are impatient. Especially moms and dads are impatient. They want to immediately impose it upon their children. That I have discovered Vedanta. So you must discover Vedanta too. Doesn't work that way. Another thing about Shraddha, I forgot to say. Just mention it quickly here. It is the sign of a good spiritual teacher, genuine spiritual teacher, that he doesn't damage the Shraddha of anybody. Shraddha in God, in spiritual things, by bhakti, meditation, uh, by selfless work, whatever way, in whichever deity you have got, do not damage that. After a lot of good karma, a lot of past life's good karma practices, one gets a little bit of devotion in this life. Don't criticize it, scoff it, make fun of it. Once in the presence of Sri Ramakrishna, there was a pandit, a scholar of logic and all. And there was some devotee talking about devotion to God and the pandit made fun of him. You know, just criticizing him for or making fun of him for believing in God and this devotion, this simple devotion. Sri Ramakrishna was very harsh. He, he told the pandit, after so many lives Good karma earned in past lives, one gets a little devotion, little bhakti in this life. You are damaging that bhakti and you call yourself a pandit. What kind of pandit are you? The pandit was so, so shocked, he got up and left from that gathering. Now, this is a great lesson to us. I have seen some very well-known, highly intellectual spiritual teachers, very highly regarded, by, especially by intellectual people, you know, intelligent people they regard them. And I won't take the name. One thing I did not like about some of these teachers is their endless criticism of others. Genuine spiritual teachers will never damage the Shraddha of anybody. They will always encourage each person uh, and, you know, take people from where they are, take them higher. If you cannot, then stand aside and pray for their welfare. Don't criticize and damage. Jesus Christ in... Um, in the Bible, about certain prophecies, he says, whatever has been prophesied, let it be fulfilled. Whatever has been there in the religion earlier, let it be fulfilled. I'm not here to say that all that is wrong. And now I'm going to start something new. You may have got something higher. What is higher than Advaita Vedanta? But the traditional teachers of Advaita Vedanta never harm people's belief in devotion, bhakti. Never harm people's belief in yoga. Never harm people's belief, even in the rituals of the Karma Kanda. They say there is something higher than that. They never say that's false and you give it up. So never damage Shraddha. If it is of a very low kind, then you try to give it an upward turn. If it is of a high kind, like a devotion, it may not be the person may not be interested in Advaita Vedanta, but the person is interested in, in devotion to maybe Narayana or Devi or in some particular devotional form, dualistic. If you're genuinely spiritual, a genuinely spiritual master will always encourage that. Will not say that that's lower, that's no good. Come here, I will show you Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. No, that's, that's an immature thing to do. It will, you will damage that other person. Jennifer says, what is the correct, correct interpretation of the word hitan in verse 22? Very nicely pointed out because there's a lot of discussion about that. Vihitan means, um, which, is, uh, which is mandated. I give, I mandate those, the, the fulfillment of desires. But hitan means those which are good for you. 
and then shankaracharya comments that the satisfaction of desires good for you must be taken only in a secondary sense upacharitam kaman hitan upacharitam upacharitam means in a secondary sense in shankara's commentary why in secondary sense then he goes on to say hitan means beneficial good he says there is nothing beneficial about satisfying desires so if the lord is satisfying your worldly desires through these other deities smaller deities there is nothing ultimately beneficial about it you must come out of it as soon as possible so yes the word hitan is actually important there god of says evil is appearing so it might work it ultimately doesn't matter yes it doesn't matter because you are a hardcore advaitin so it doesn't matter i used to analyze dreams before understanding other correct now it is just a dream i remind myself of a janaka story also remembering diamond story and seeing awareness is invaluable diamond seems the way to be established in a vedantic way correct these are very high understandings very noble uh, and notice they apply all the time they are they will take you to the highest goal and uh, they demand demand very high thinking and simple life a disciplined life these are good signs shri says it appears that people turn to the lower practices in offer efforts to gain control in life exactly assuming this lack of sense of lack of control comes from not trusting god is in control of the outcomes i suppose we should pray first and foremost for trust exactly why do people turn to all kinds of deities and all kinds of practices because they feel uh, my life is not going well i wish my life were better and these are ways of somehow magically getting control of my life it's a weakness of the mind and overcome by desires and of course there is suffering in life and so we just hope that somehow this might work you know sometimes it does seem to work ultimately none of this is good ultimately it's much better to trust in god because god is in charge of all of it sri krishna clearly says you have worldly problems come to me with those worldly problems come to god not particular occult practices we have bindu says we have gods with several names like ganesh saraswati lakshmi do these gods fall with small g with gods with small g no so ganesh or saraswati lakshmi these are all names of saguna brahman from advaitic perspective brahman with power of maya is god with capital g only thing is in the hindu understanding this god with capital g is infinite in forms and appearances it can appear it can be formless it can be with form it will come in the next verse form and formless both are possible and which form is it ganesha is it lakshmi is it durga all of them all of them are saguna brahman saguna brahman god has infinite uh, manifestation and that's all the same one reality god with capital g okay rick and sweet because one can perform it one's own dharma though lesser in merit is better than the dharma of another correct we have different tastes different capacities um, inherited from past lives in whichever way one can catch hold of god with a capital g and that's good you are catching hold of the same reality it doesn't have to be non dual vedanta aham brahmasmi you can you could get a working understanding of what non dual vedanta says and you can uh, repeat the uh, mantra of your ishta devata and be full of love and devotion and surrender to ishta devata you will see in the next verse we will see next time that um, there is a clear advaitic interpretation of that verse shankaracharya shankaracharya avoids the advaitic interpretation and goes straight for the devotional interpretation because now we are in that phase of the gita where god with capital g saguna brahman is primary not the atman or nirguna brahman so chapter 7 to chapter 12 good om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu